Well, this is a special Sunday, yes? yes? And you sit and you think to yourself, what does one speak on? And for those who've been here enough, we've been leapfrogging through one Chronicles, haven't we? The really interesting passage, yes? yes. yes. Oh, okay, we're going to get there slowly but surely. Marvellous. Well, now, Pastor David, as you may well know, has always done, normally here at Greenford, lots of teaching on whole books. He's taken a book and then done a series of teaching on it, yes? He wouldn't want me to break that routine, would he? No? Say no. You may want me to break it because you're getting bored of One Chronicles, but I'm not. Uh, so we're going to continue because it felt right for today. Because part of One Chronicles is actually them looking at their history reflecting on it so it informs their future, learning from their history, amen? And we should always learn from our history. And seeing now this passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 that we're going to look at, that Andy's going to flash up for me, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, he's actually now looking at something that King David did, and King David, as we know, is known as a man after God's own heart. Well, Pastor David is also known as a man after God's own So therefore, I think it's quite nice, isn't it? You with me? Good morning. Good morning. Excellent, that's better. We're all with me, yes? Yeah. Cool. Because we're going to have to get into this this morning. You may not enjoy bits of it, I warn you now. But what you will do, hopefully, is hear God in the process. Are you up for that? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, now if you can remember, 1 Chronicles, or the whole of Chronicles, 1 and 2 Chronicles, as I said, is written to the Jewish people who have returned back hundreds of years later from, uh, this is exile, this is years, hundreds of years later since King David. And they're really looking back at the glory days and going, where are the glory days? And this is to remind them of what some of it looked like. So they're going to do that. So we are today going to look at 1 Chronicles at a moment that didn't have an element of glory in it. It's the return of the Ark of the Covenant. The gold surrounded wooden box that held the stone tablets of the covenant that Moses took down. Aaron's staff and a jar of manna according to the book of Hebrews but most importantly the ark being the footstool of God therefore it was regarded as charged with the very power and presence of the divine God quite an important artifact really yes most of us what's your most important artifact that you hold in your house that you would go Whatever happens, that's precious. I don't want that to go anywhere. Hands up if it's a TV. Yeah, that's what I thought. Hands up if it's your skybox. Oh, thank you for your honesty. But this is charged with the very presence of God. So therefore then, this is the very symbol that God himself was present. So this author, or the authors of Chronicles, are trying to remind the people of just the story around the covenant of the box, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark, and how important it is to them. What the real kicker is, is by this time the Ark is long gone. I don't know where it is. But I want to import, remind them of the importance of the presence of God. So here we go. I did promise Timmy because we were running very differently today that I would cut, make sure that the talk lasts no more than 20 minutes. That's my version of 20 minutes. So we've got about another 10 on. You up for that? Good. Okay, let's start. Verse 1. David consulted with all his officials, including the generals and captains of his army. Then he, then he addressed the entire assembly of Israel as follows. If you approve... And if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send messages to all the Israelites throughout the land, including the priests and Levites in their towns and pasture lands. Let us invite them to come and join us. It is a time to bring back the ark of our God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. 
just want us to take note. David is calling all the people of Israel, all the officials and all the army commanders. If you remember from when I spoke last time, the army of commanders were absolutely behind David as king. Do you remember? From last week, they were behind him. And the challenge was for us, are we really truly behind Jesus as our commander? Series is on the internet. It's called Stand Behind Your Man. I couldn't resist. Somehow a song, stand by your man. And I couldn't resist. I had to stick. I'm not going to try and sing anymore. That will do. So here we have this. The people are, he's calling the people together. If it's your, if you think it's a good idea, and if it's the will of our Lord, let us send messages. Well, the whole assembly, verse 4, agreed to this. For the people could see it was the right thing to do. It's almost like 30 years of a members meeting, all unified. Yes? Nobody getting that joke, no? Okay, fine. We'll move on. So, want to call all the priests and the Levites. This is really important, and we'll come to that later on. But the Ark of the Covenant was neglected to return back to Jerusalem during the reign of King Saul. Let's uh, see what actually happened to it. Well, the ark had been taken by the Philistines some 20 years before. The Philistines had taken it, they defeated the Israelites, took the ark of the covenant, and uh, they put it into one of their towns in their temple of their god Dagon. Well, that night, Dagon's statue fell over. Strange that. And then, um, basically... Plague, sort of bit of famine, illness started striking. So for a number of years, a number of months, what then happened was that the Philistines started transferring the ark like a hot potato or a hot coal to each town, wanting to get rid of it. Who's ever watched Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yes. Please put your hands if you've watched it. Yes. If you've not watched it, please raise your hands. <laughs> we'll have a word later. <laughs> But if you've ever seen that scene, there's a scene when they initially capture the Ark of the Covenant and they box it in the Nazi box and stamp it with the uh, Nazi symbol on it. Well, what then? This never actually happened, by the way. Just, just before, this is fantasy, okay? Just, yeah, sorry about that. So, spoiler, I know, but it never happened. But literally, what you see is a moment where this bit of power happens and it burns out the Nazi symbol on the side of the crate. So take that image and think, in reality what happened is when it was in the temple of Dagon, Dagon's statue falls and eventually head falls off. God's going, uh, 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 nobody's having power over me, I'm the ruler. Okay? That's the imagery behind that. So, Philistines, they want to get rid of it, quick. They don't like it, they realise they've done the wrong thing. So, they decide they need to return it. So, 1 Samuel... Chapter 6, which you can't pull up, but I shall read to you. Chapter 6, 7 to 8. When they realise their mistake, they need to return it back. So they gather some people together and they say, oh, what should we do? Well, let's uh, put uh, some gold on it and let's try and return it back with almost like a, a guilt offering back to the Israelites. So now build a new cart and find two cows that have been given birth to calves. Make sure the cows have never been yoked to a cart. So in other words, they're almost virgin cows, you know, they've never pulled a cart. So everything's got to be brand new. We're trying to really sort of, as you can imagine, people want to get things right with somebody. Yeah, you don't, you don't give them a second hand something, do you? If you've upset someone, you don't give them anything second hand, do you? Yeah, if you want to write a card that's saying, I really am sorry, I forgot your birthday. Yeah, you don't sort of just grab somebody else's card and scrub off the name at the front that's already there, do you? Do you? Steve might, but not Steve Pound, Steve Williams. This is okay, Steve, sorry. <laughs> sorry, two Steves here, that's going to be confusing for me now. Mr. Pound wouldn't, but Steve would. So you wouldn't do that, would you? So here's the same sort of imagery. They are trying to do everything new. So build a new cart, find two new cows, and uh, hitch the cows to the cart, but shut the calves away from the pen. Put the ark of the Lord on the cart, and beside it place a gold containing the gold rats and gold tumours you are sending as a guilt offering. Then let the cows go wherever they want. It's a good way to send it back, isn't it? It's like sometimes giving it to a courier, isn't it? Give it to the courier and it will go wherever it wants. It may not be delivered. 
If it's Amazon, it doesn't always work the next day. It could be the next week. So they send off this new cart. And the new cart I want us to hold in our thinking. It eventually arrives, um, and I just want to read verse 19, and think Raiders of the Lost Ark right now. Who's seen the end scene? When they open the ark, what happens? The come out. Yeah, well, it's meant to be angels, actually, Steve. And then it's meant to be the angels of death. Not demons coming out the Ark of the Covenant. That's a bit worrying, isn't it, really? But it's the imagery. And what do they do to the, uh, the n- evil Nazi soldiers? Melts their face, yes. Dude, kills them all, don't they? And throughout the entire time, you've got Indiana Jones going, keep your eyes shut, don't look. Yeah? You think, oh, how did he know that? Well, read this. Verse 19 of 2 Samuel. But the Lord killed 70 men from Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. So the cart had arrived. You think this is really cheery for a 30th anniversary, don't you? It's really good. Okay, we're getting there. And so they looked inside the ark. And the people mourned greatly because what the Lord had done. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God, they cried out. Where can we send the ark from here? So they sent messages to the people of Kerith Jerem and told them, the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come here and get it. In other words, we don't want to go anywhere near it now. We're recognising the holy presence of God. So for 20 years it stays in Kerith Jerem because they did come and get it. So let's carry on. So the whole assembly, uh, sorry, 1 Chronicles 13 verse 4. The whole assembly agreed to this, for the people could see it was the right thing to do. So David summoned all Israel from the Shehar brook of Egypt in the south to all the way to the town of Lebo Hamath in the north to join in bringing the ark of God from Kirith Jerem. Then David and all Israel went to Bala of Judah into the Kirith Jerem to bring back the ark of the Lord, which bears the name of the Lord, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart. Okay, so this is now the Israelites. It's very important. And brought it from Abinadab's house, by the way, who had been looking after it all this time. User and I, Ahio, do you know, I've been doing really well with all the long names until that moment, were guiding the cart. David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, singing songs, playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, Pastor David. If you don't know, years ago when I first came in, Pastor David, do tambourine. Okay. (laughs) Cymbals and trumpets. And we'll leave it at that for a minute. So, get the imagery. They get the ark, they stick it on a new cart. And then they're celebrating, they're dancing. We're bringing the ark of God back. We're bringing the presence of the Lord back. Who enjoyed the dancing this morning? Yeah? Who really got down and boogied? Yeah? Worshipping the Lord in your dance. Well, that's what they were doing. They were really pleased with what they've done. And user, let's just concentrate on him, he was either alongside the car, could have been riding the car, and he was probably giving it all of this. Now I've got a bit of a slight quirk with that user. I can imagine he was probably thinking, check me out, we've had this in the house for nearly 20 years. Yeah? My name's going to go down in history. (sighs) Bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. New cart. Anybody see what's wrong here at the moment? All the people did all this prep work. Notice how people prepared everything, ready to make this happen. They all thought this was a good idea. And then we get to this moment in verse 9. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark. 
Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah and he struck him dead because he had laid his hand on the ark. So Uzzah died there in the presence of God. It's at this point we're all going to go, but why? All he did was touch the ark to steady it so it wouldn't fall. He was doing a good thing, wasn't he? Come on, let's be honest. Most of us read that one line and think, God, you're bang out of order. Yeah? Am I wrong? Or do we all just sort of ignore and go, oh, that's just the Lord? Yeah, the Lord's will be done, and we leave it at that. Oh, we have... Yeah, as long as it isn't you, John. Yeah, but it was in the presence of the Lord. That was a good thing. But it's not, in fact, the most cheerful thing. What had happened? Well, let's look at, very quickly, Numbers chapter 4, 5 to 15. Just at one area of how the, how the ark was meant to have been carried. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, record the names of the members of the clans and the families of the Kohathanite division of the tribe of Israel. List all the men between the ages of 30 and 50. I'm in still. 47. Just, thank you, Mr. Pound. Who were eligible to serve the t in the tabernacle. The duties of the Kohathanites at the tabernacle will relate to the most sacred objects. When the camp moves, Aaron and his sons must enter the tabernacle first to take down the inner curtain and cover the Ark of the Covenant with it. And I'm just going to skip on. And then they must spread over a single piece of blue cloth. Finally, they must put the carrying poles of the Ark in place. The camp will be ready to move when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the sacred articles. The Kohathanites will come and carry these things to the next destination, but they must not touch the sacred objects or they will die. And in verse 20 it also states, the Kohathanites must never enter the sanctuary to look at the sacred objects for even a moment, or they will die. Clear instructions. Stick the carrying poles into the ark and carry the ark. It's quite a clear instruction, isn't it? It wasn't rocket science, was it? So what was going on? Well, we'll reflect in a minute how they did it properly in a moment. But just think for a moment, they decided to get a new cart. Was it to make their life easier, do you think? Lazy. Ah, lazy. Yeah, lazy. Thank you, Barry. Just stick it on a new cart, that'd make life easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> Maybe they thought they were honouring God by doing it as well. Maybe the fact it got returned by a new art, uh, cart, they thought, oh, we better do the same then. Better do the same as those who don't worship God. We better do the same. Needs to be taken seriously. A clear instruction. Use carrying poles. User probably wasn't a Levite. His dad was, been a dad was, but not him. So he shouldn't have even been involved in moving the ark. So even as a priest, he shouldn't have even been touching it. Use the carrying poles, says God. This is not rocket science. So verse 11 to 14. David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against user. Thanks, David. It's great. You, not, not, not Pastor David. King David being angry. He named that place Perez user because it means to burst out against user. It was still called today. This is, gets me, verse 12. David was now afraid of God. David is known as a man after God's own heart. And that obviously had to take him on a journey with God. And one of those things, all that celebrating before, he's probably thinking, I've got God's grace all over me. I've been anointed to lead these people. The people are behind me. Wow, God must be right with me. Probably had never quite 
got fully the idea of God's holiness in its fullest form until that moment. So, how can I ever bring the ark of God back into my care? So David did not move the ark into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of God remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months. And the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he owned. So God was not against the people because he was still blessing Obed who looked after the ark. Where God's got a problem is with the way the instructions, how they did not do it properly. They didn't do it correctly. So having a go at user and taking him out in the way that he did was like, this was all wrong. And you can't blame, you can't say, we can't blame Uzzah, it wasn't his fault. He was doing what his own king told him. Well, we maybe have to look at the attitude of user, as I said. And we don't really know her much, but I do wonder if he was prideful in walking along with the ark. Wouldn't you be? If you're walking along with somebody really famous, you go, hey, look at me. Yeah? Think of anybody famous that you might like, movie star, you know, and you'll be like, check me out. You want to take pictures all the time. Selfie! <laughs> yeah? David's saying, no, you're doing this wrong. The holy presence of God should never be taken with a sense of, oh, it's just God, isn't it? There has to be something behind it. There has to be some clear instructions sometimes that we follow. If you lend a piece of equipment to a friend and you show them how to do it and operate it properly, you expect them to, to follow the rules, don't you? Yeah. yeah? If they do it their own way and bring it back to you damaged, how happy won't you be? Yeah, that's why I don't lend an equipment to anybody now. <coughs> no, I'm joking. But you know, if you give something to someone, you expect them to follow the instructions fully? Yeah? So how much more should they have done that here with the Ark of the Lord? Respecting the instructions that he had given. So let's leap to exactly how what happened now very quickly. Chapter 15, verse 11. There's a whole gap here in between. Uh, of uh, between 14 and 15 I'm not going to go into now because it's not related to this specific ark but now David realizes that it's now time to ring, br try and bring the ark of the covenant back and he says then David summoned the priest Zadok and Abathar and these Levite leaders Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemir, Emil and Abimadab he said to them you are the leaders of the Levite families. You must purify yourselves and all the fellow Levites so you can bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. Because you Levites did not carry the ark the first time. The anger of the Lord, our God, burst out against us. We failed to ask God how to move it properly. Failed to ask God how to move it properly. So the priests and the Levites purified themselves in order to bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to Jerusalem. Then the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with its carrying poles, just as the Lord had instructed Moses. Yay! David also ordered the Levite leaders to appoint a choir of Levites who were singers and musicians to sing joyful songs to accompany of the harps, the lyres, and the cymbals. Wow, order of service. <laughs> the offering's in there as well. So are the notices. No, they're not. But the point is, started to realise, after they read the instructions, ah, oh, we've got to appoint all these right people. We can't go about this slap dash. We must ask the Lord, what does he want us to do? So here's the question for you, not to answer, but to think. When you think something's a good idea, do you think it might be God's idea or your good idea? You might well have people agreeing with you and saying, yeah, that's a great idea. Go ahead and do it. Doesn't mean it's God's idea. Or it might be an idea that God wants to serve a need in the community. 
and we just go headlong in. Way, Let's just get on with it. And God's going, that's not the way I want you to do it. I want you to do it this way. You with me? We can all have this great idea and go, well, the world does it like this. This is a nice layout plan. Because this is how the world does it, like the Philistines did with the new cart. Like the Israelites then copied them almost with the new cart. But God's going, but no, I want you to do it this way. Why? Because this brings me glory. So ask yourself, are you doing stuff at the moment? Or you think something's a good plan and a good idea for the future? And you're saying, oh, the Lord will bless this. That's the other thing that gets me. Pray for me that the Lord will bless this idea that I've had. It should be the other way. Yeah? Lord, is this a good idea? Do you want me to do this? And if the Lord says yes, then he'll bless it anyway, because it was his idea in the first place. Amen? Amen. If Pastor David had come here 30 years ago and gone, I just want to establish a church that's actually multi-ethnic, that represents the community, or I just think it's a really great idea to be the chair of this committee to go and set up these whopping great big mounds in the community. If he thought that was all a great idea of his own and God hadn't, wasn't God's idea, then we wouldn't be here 30 years on like this. You wouldn't be passing North Thala Fields on the A40 going, wow, look at those mounds. How many of us actually pass and go, isn't it wonderful to see the community walking up and down those mounds? Yeah, when the bright sun shines out. This afternoon, because it's warm, every day. But today, because it's going to be stunningly good weather, there's going to be tons of people up there. Isn't that great? And to know we were part of that as a church because we have released and allowed Pastor David to spend time doing it. Amen? The fact that we can, on a good Friday, spend time up there with other churches, spending time good Friday doing that, wow. It took a long time to build North Isla, didn't it, in the way it is now? And sometimes with God, it has to take a long time. It's not instant. You can't just stick something new at it to make it happen. God doesn't work like that. We're very good at checking credit cards at something. Amen? Yeah, yeah, just be honest. I want that now. And God's saying no. The reason we're here, 30 years of celebrating the anniversary of Pastor David's ministry here at Greenford, is because he inquired of the Lord. He asked the Lord don't worry, I'm not going to give a load of secrets away. But he asked the Lord, what do you want me to do here? My brothers and sisters were part of the result. Now I just want to see this last bit, 20, verse 25 to 26. Then David and the elders of Israel and the generals of the army went to the house of Obed-Edom to bring the ark of the Lord's covenant up to Jerusalem with a great celebration. And because God was clearly helping the Levites as they carried the ark of the Lord's covenant, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. And it's that moment and because God was clearly helping the Levites. I'm sure carrying the ark wasn't exactly light, but they could clearly tell that the Lord was helping. The Lord was involved in it. Now, it doesn't make, it means that their path was smooth. It doesn't mean actually the road going back to Jerusalem probably wasn't without its sort of potholes, etc. Pretty much like Greenford Roads now. Anyway, moving on. But the point being that God was helping them. And when that's seen, if God's involved, it will be accomplished. Amen? Amen. That for me is the lesson from this today. Is we have to listen to the Lord. And inquire of him what he wants to do. And we've got prophecies going back to 1998. Where God is going... Listen to me. 
I'm a holy God. Listen to what I have to say. Listen first. And that's not just on a Sunday morning. That's every day of the week. Amen? So I don't know how you're going to wake up. How did you wake up this morning? Full of the joys of spring, I thought, I can't wait for church. Yeah, hello. Okay. How are you going to wake up tomorrow? Full of the joys of spring? How about full of waking up and going, the Lord's here. His very presence is here. What are we going to do today, Lord? Yeah? Sure, there's been great days past today where you've woken up going, what should we do today, Lord? And then watch God at work. So let's take a few moments. Close your eyes. Listen to God for yourself. We are actually in the prisons. As you, if anybody knows now, I, I always like to spend the first five minutes of any meeting these days recognising that we are in the presence of a holy God. We have been all of this morning, we know that. But just take a moment to know that he is here, he's not a distant God, and listen to him. Maybe in all of that you've been hearing God, maybe you've had some plans in the back of your head and you've suddenly heard God say, those are not my instructions, that's not my will. Listen to him now, lift up the plans to him. Maybe there is, uh, you've forgotten that he truly is a holy God and almost taken him loosely and for granted. Now he loves us with an abounding grace, but we must also recognise that he is an awesome God. And awesome means how powerful and magnificent he is. And maybe we shouldn't take him so loosely. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.